Hello. Today's lesson is the draping of a basic bodice. Draping is a pattern making method that basically takes two dimensional fabric and converts it to a three dimensional garment. Using various techniques for making the gar garment fit the form, the body shape is defined in the fabric. The fabric for draping is usually muslin, although any fabric can be draped. The bodice on the figure is a basic bodice that has two darts, a shoulder dart and a waistline dart. The shoulder dart generally falls halfway between the neckline and the armhole. The waistline dart usually falls on the princess line that is defined on the form. A dart is a system for making the muslin fit. Because the body is shaped from large to small in certain areas, it's necessary to pick up amounts of fabric to make the garment fit the form. The dart will usually go from nothing at the largest point to a larger amount of fabric at the smallest point. An example of that is apex to shoulder. When a figure is very full breasted, the dart will be larger and therefore longer. The back of the bodice is similar to the front in that it also has two darts, one at the shoulder and one at the waistline. However, because of the different shape of the back, there not being an apex at the back, the back shoulder dart tends to be smaller and therefore shorter. There is a waistline dart that falls in a similar place to the front dart on the princess line on the back of the figure. The basic bodice has the cross grain line as well as the lengthwise grain line balanced at the side seam. This is a particularly well-suited bodice to using for stripes or plaids. In order to drape the basic bodice, an amount of fabric will have to be prepared that will be large enough to accommodate one quarter of the waist, since we always work on half of the figure. In order to prepare the muslin, we will have to measure the form for the size of the piece of muslin needed. The length will be measured from metal band to waistline with four inches added on for working. The width will be measured from the far side of the side seam all the way over the apex to the center front seam. To that amount, four inches will also be added. That piece of muslin has already been prepared and looks like this. Okay. Now, in draping muslin, certain very important points are, import are necessary. We will always need to know where the lengthwise grain is and where the crosswise grain is. Those areas, the lengthwise grain and the crosswise grain, already appear on the muslin as threads. In order to make it easier for us to follow them, we're going to draw the lines on the muslin. We need always to know where the center front grain line is so that we can define it on the muslin as well as on the form. I'm going to draw in a grain line. Because muslin is never worked up till the edge of the fabric, I'm going to draw the lengthwise grain in one inch over from the raw edge. Okay. 
there are many methods of drawing in the line. One is to use the L square on a very well blocked piece of muslin and to follow one thread down with your eye and with the ruler and get a perfectly straight line. Another method is to use a very sharp pencil or a pin and measure over the one inch and then follow down with that very sharp pencil all the way down. A combination of methods works very well. To measure over one inch from the raw edge, mark it on the muslin, and then draw in a lengthwise grain. Having to find the lengthwise grain, it's now necessary to draw in a crosswise grain. For the basic bodice, the crosswise grain will generally fall about halfway on the entire piece of muslin. If you fold the bottom of the muslin up to the top and crease, you can then find the center of the muslin, use a ruler and or your eye together with the pulling method and follow one thread across the muslin as a guideline for the cross grain line. The cross grain line is also used as the apex line. It will fall in the apex area of the form. Another necessary guideline to the draping of this basic bodice is to mark exactly where the apex appears on the figure and transfer it to the muslin. For that purpose, I'm going to measure from apex over to center front very carefully. This measurement should be to the eighth of an inch. It's not an approximation. It's an exact measurement. Apex to center front is then transferred to the muslin, apex to center front, and a cross mark is made. Another mark that will be needed is a guideline that appears halfway between the apex and the side seam. I'm going to measure from the far side of the side seam over to the apex line. Whatever number appears, I will divide in half and use that number to mark from apex over for a guide line and cross mark. Now, both of those lines will be drawn down on the muslin on perfectly straight grain, lengthwise grain. Having prepared the muslin, I am now ready to begin the draping. When draping any bodice at all, or for that matter, any part of the pattern, it is desirable to turn back on the center front line so that the center front is very clearly defined and there isn't any question about where the center front appears. It's always best to crease the center front line back with your fingernail rather than pressing it down with an iron. Pressing muslin back with an iron usually causes the grain to become distorted. So we'll just turn it back. In addition to that, I'm going to crease the line from the apex down to the bottom of the muslin, holding it up towards me. Okay. At this point, I'm ready to approach the figure. Very important when you're working muslin and forms is to bring the form up 
so that you are facing the form at eye level. It's bad draping to approach the form looking down or looking up at it. You should be looking directly at the area you're working on. One very good rule for draping, for beginning to drape, is to begin with what you know. There is always a place defined on the muslin that has been defined on the figure. And that would be the beginning place. In the case of the basic bodice, the place that you know on the muslin and the place that you know on the figure is the apex intersection. I'm going to place a pin right into the cross mark where the apex line and the cross grain line meet. At that intersection, I'm putting a pin and placing it into the apex of the form. The pin is now extending up, pointing up. And at this point, if that were the only pin I leave in there, the muslin is not really secure. It will move up and down. In order for the muslin to be well draped, it must be secured. And for that purpose, I'm going to put a pin going down. With a pin going down and a pin going up, I have secured the muslin sufficiently so that it will not move up and down. The next step after the muslin has been secured to the form is to turn to the first grain line. In this case, the cross grain line going from apex to side seam. What I'm looking for is a line that is perfectly balanced with all the flat levels in the room. In other words, I would like that line to be parallel with the table and with the floor. I don't want it to shift up or shift down. The best way to determine if the line is straight is to start by pinning it to the form and stepping back and looking at it and seeing if what you see is indeed a line that is straight going from side seam to apex. Uh, that is sometimes difficult to determine. One of the things that helps is looking at the lengthwise grain and the crosswise grain together. This is an L square shape. They are at exact right angles. If this line is straight, this line is straight. If one line is slanting, the other line is slanting. They are completely dependent on each other. So I'm looking for straight down and straight across. In addition, in pinning it, I'm also looking for a bit of ease going from apex to side seam. How much is a bit of ease? A very small amount. It really is not any measurable amount. It's not a number. It's just something that you feel in your hand that says, this is not as tight as the skin on the figure. Therefore, you can just kind of feel an easy feel as you approach it. Not pinching in the ease, just letting it appear as a softness. Step back, put a pin in the guideline, and step back and look at it. Do the lines look as if they are squared to each other? Another test for the straightness of the cross grain line is if the muslin boxes around the figure. The muslin should form a boxy shape. When the muslin slants and is not straight, it will tend to fall in on the figure because it will then fall on the bias and the bias clings to the body. The straight grain will stand away from the body, and you will get this boxy effect. When you're reasonably certain that what you're looking at is nice and straight and square, you may then put two other pins to hold the line very secure going down. You therefore have pins that are going up and pins that are going down, so that as we work the muslin up and as we work the muslin down, no shift will take place from that perfect cross grain that you have established. Okay. Having now determined 
one grain, we're going to approach the next. The next being the straight grain line that is the guide line. I'm going to bring that guide line straight down as it hangs, but bring it into the form. Now, this is sometimes a difficult process. Uh, when you deal with straight lines on a round body, it isn't always very easy to determine what's straight. However, if you simply smooth the muslin down with your hand as it hangs, trying very hard not to shift it right or left, just straight down, when you come to the waistline area, you're going to pin it, and this time we're going to pin it with a tiny little pinch of ease. How much is a tiny little pinch of ease? Well, it doesn't have a number, and it's not a measurable amount of fabric. It just is a small amount that is brought over from one side to the other and ensures that the waistline of the garment will not turn out too tight. As you sew a garment, eventually this will become a pattern. Eventually it will become a real garment. And as you sew a garment, each time you put a stitch in, the waistline gets a little bit tighter. Therefore, to ensure that it doesn't get too tight to get back on the body, we will be adding little pinches of ease in various points of the muslin. Okay, having established the cross grain, the lengthwise grain, we are now ready to proceed with pinning the muslin to the side seam of the form. However, because the hip area is larger than the waistline area, in order to have the muslin go from waistline over this large hip area, I'm going to have to slash the muslin. And I'm going to slash it right on that guideline that I drew in. It's slashed on grain to within about a quarter of an inch of the pin. That makes it possible then to smooth the muslin over to the side seam waistline intersection. And I'm going to place a pin that is going to hold the muslin to that part of the form. Now, notice the way I've placed the pin. I've placed it in an opposing direction to the way I am working the muslin. What I want is maximum hold with minimum pins. You get that by making every pin count and hold very well. It will hold very well if you face the pin in the opposite direction to the way you plan to work the muslin. We've now established lengthwise grain and crosswise grain and side seam waistline intersection. And we'll go on to center front line and picking up everything that's left over after we place the center front of the muslin to the center front of the form, there will be an amount of fabric left over that amount of fabric will become waistline dart. Now, in order to place the muslin, I'm going to have the fold of the muslin rest exactly on the center front of the form. Now, having it rest exactly on the center front of the form is very important because if you go over the center front, you will end up with a garment with excess fabric in it and too big for this size. If you go short of center front, you will end up with a muslin that is too small for this garment. So the ideal placement is with the fold line of the muslin resting exactly on the center front line of the form, which is the seam. At the same time that I am placing this center front, I'm going to be pinching the excess fullness to become the waistline dart. And looking at that crosswise grain, which is not drawn on the muslin, but is there as a thread, and I'm going to try and train my eye to see one thread running from dart to pin at 
the center of the waistline tape. I'm also going to pin the dart. Now the pin for the dart is very simple. It is right in the center of the waistline tape, picking up only one quarter inch of fabric, straddling the center of the tape. I will not pin the dart all the way up. It's not necessary. Picking it up only at the waistline is sufficient. Having established the crosswise grain at the waistline, I can now move on to smoothing the muslin up to approximately where the fullness of the breast starts, which is about an inch and a half or so below the apex line. Um, where the curve of the breast starts is where you want to put a pin, looking as you do at all of the crosswise threads to determine that they are perfectly straight. When you deal with half a muslin, it's difficult to see that eventually the muslin will cover the entire figure and it will go from apex to apex. Therefore, there will always be an amount of fullness that is excess in the center of the muslin where there isn't any body, but there needs to be fullness so that the fabric can go across. We allow for that fullness by determining that the center the grain lines across from dart to center front are perfectly straight below the apex and that again the grains from apex up from apex to center front are also perfectly straight. In that way the fullness will form that is necessary for the garment to have to go from apex to apex. Now what you want to do is Follow the lengthwise grain up from the apex and then follow it with your eye or with a pin forming a square across to center front. And the muslin wants to be straight above the apex and it wants to be straight below the apex. We'll then smooth the muslin up from that apex level up to the center front neckline, center front, intersection, and pin. The bottom of the muslin has been completed, the draping has been completed, and we're ready to approach the upper half of the muslin, which will include the neckline and the shoulder dart. In order to have the neckline drape nicely around the form, it will not go around the way it is. It's too tight and it doesn't fit. The muslin is going to have to be slashed. Again, I'm working on the top of the form. I'm going to lower the dress form so that I am again looking at it at eye level and I'm comfortable with it. To determine the neckline, I'm going to have to slash the muslin and the method is very well defined. One inch up from that neckline center front pin, I'm going to slash straight across for one inch now one inch is easy to determine because I have a fold back of one inch. From that one inch I'm going straight up and taking out a small rectangular piece of muslin. This will allow the muslin to come around the neckline somewhat. It still will not fit comfortably but it will come around somewhat. However, because I'm going to need to slash the neckline to get it to fit well, I'm going to crease the neckline seam with my fingernail. What I don't want to do is slash down too far. I don't want my slashes to come and destroy the neckline seam. So if you crease it with your fingernail on the neckline seam, which is easy to do because the neckline seam is clearly defined, you can then slash into the corner of the rectangle and then one inch away and one inch again which will give you sufficient slashes to bring the muslin around the neckline. I'm slashing into the corner 
not quite to that neckline crease. And then again, and once more. Little short of the neckline crease because as you release the muslin, the crease will move down. And if you slash too far, you'll end up without enough fabric to fill the neckline. Okay. Once that has been smoothed and fits nicely to the form, I'm going to place a pin at the neckline shoulder intersection, which appears halfway around the neck. Neckline shoulder intersection is pinned, the neckline fits smoothly, and I'm ready to approach the shoulder dart. To do the shoulder dart, what I like to do is determine where it's going to be. And as I said before, the shoulder dart on the basic bodice generally falls on the princess line. I'm going to feel for that princess line, and you can feel it because it is quite a bump where the shoulder and princess line come together. And place a dot at that point. I'm then going to pick up the dot and crease it because all of the muslin that is left over, all this fullness that is left because this apex is bigger than this shoulder, I'm going to smooth up and lay down under that fold. All of it. I don't want anything left over for the armhole. I want the armhole to lay very smooth. No extra fullness in the armhole. Now, once you're sure you've got all of the fullness picked up, I'm going to pin the shoulder seam, dart seam, down to the form, flat to the form. That means that this dart is pinned differently than the waistline dart. The waistline dart protrudes from the figure, and the shoulder dart is pinned flat. One more pin is needed to complete the muslin. And that is the pin at the side seam arm plate intersection, which occurs right where the side seam and the metal plate come together. And I'm going to place another pin there, which is going to hold the side seam in place. And that then completes the actual draping of the muslin. The next step is called marking. The marking of the muslin entails transferring important marks from the figure onto the muslin so that the lines that will become the seam lines or the sewing lines when this is turned into a garment can be drawn clearly and well to form a pattern. Now, the marking from the form is very important. If you mark from the form and leave some of the important marks out, you're going to find that uh, you have to put the muslin back on again. And that's not what you want to do. So one method for being sure that you mark everything and don't leave anything out is to start in one place and go around. My method is to start at the underarm seam plate intersection and mark around counterclockwise around the neck and back to the armhole. That way, if I go completely around and don't skimp from neckline to side seam to waistline, I'm not likely to forget anything. So I'm going to start at the underarm seam, again raising the form so that it's at eye level. And I'm going to feel for the underarm plate area with my finger, move that pin for a moment, and cross mark the plate. A cross mark is a mark that appears on intersections of the muslin, such as armhole and side seam. Now, in marking the side seam, you want to be very sure that you mark to the far side of the seam. This seam, the side seam on the form, unlike the other seams, center front, princess line, neckline, shoulder, is a rather thick seam. It's not the flat seam of the center front. It has width. 
And since you always want to give yourself the benefit of any extra muslin that you can, we always are going to mark on the far side of the seam, which you can feel with your finger and with your pencil. The arm plate and the side seam are marked with this cross mark. Now, there are going to be no marks from the plate to the waistline. This will eventually be a straight line drawn with the ruler, and it's not necessary to mark the entire seam. When you have a straight line, all you need is a beginning and an end. The end for this will come in the middle of the waistline tape. We'll put another cross mark showing the direction of the waistline and a cross mark on the far side of the seam. We now have two cross marks clearly defined, one at the plate, one at the waistline. I'm going to mark the waistline very simply by placing one dot halfway between the guideline and the side seam in the middle of the tape. One dot. And then I'm going to place a dot halfway between the guideline and the dart in the middle of the tape. Again, one dot. The marking of the dart is interesting. What you want to mark when you mark the dart is exactly what you have picked up. You don't want to mark near it, around it, close to it. You want to mark the exact place. The best way to do that is to run your pencil on the dart pickup. Now the pin is clearly picking up an amount of fabric. If you run your pencil above and below that pickup, you will be marking exactly where the pin is. I'm then going to mark the direction of the waistline in the middle of the tape. I'm going to flip the dart over and do the same thing on the other side. Mark the dart pickup and then mark the waistline. In this way, I'm marking exactly what I'm picking up. Now, remember what I said earlier. The waistline from the dart to the center front is on perfectly straight grain. Therefore, it really isn't necessary to put any dots here. When the muslin is flat on the table, we'll be able to follow one thread across right to center front. So I'm not going to put any mark here. I'm just going to kind of crease it with my fingernail so that I know approximately where I'm coming back to. Now, once the waistline and dart area have been defined, there will be no marks on the muslin going up center front. We don't mark the pins that are holding the apex in place. The very next marks that will happen will happen at the neckline. And for that purpose, it's necessary to lower the form. Okay. I'm going to again crease the neckline to be sure that I'm staying exactly with the neckline seam of the form. The center front will be a cross mark, just a little line indicating where the center front and the neckline meet. The rest of the neckline is marked with a series of dots about a half inch apart coming round the neckline to the shoulder neckline intersection. At the shoulder neckline intersection, I'm going to put another cross mark. Cross mark direction for the neckline and cross mark direction for the shoulder. So there is the same kind of cross mark at the neckline shoulder intersection that appears at the side seam and the waistline. The dart has been pinned and I'm going to leave it just as it's pinned. It has a dot on one side and I'm going to put a line on the other side showing where the fold hits the muslin as it comes down. I'm then going to pin the shoulder or mark the shoulder ridge intersection and that needs a little defining. The shoulder is this area or this seam. The armhole, however, is divided into two parts. There is a top part that is fabric and it is called the ridge. 
And then there is this metal plate, which is called the metal plate. Therefore, um, I need to know where they both are. The top part of the form, that is the ridge, will be marked on the muslin as a cross mark. And the shoulder seam will be marked with a line going in the direction of the shoulder seam. So I now have another cross mark at the shoulder ridge intersection. The marking of the armhole, again, is another approach. We're going to mark the ridge, which is the fabric part of the armhole, down as far as the screw mark. The screw mark is the screw that's holding the plate in place. The top part of the armhole will be marked with dots right here on this ridge. And you can feel the ridge through the muslin. It's the place where the form actually finishes. And I'm going to mark that with dots every half inch and feel for the plate mark so I know where to stop. The plate screw mark. Okay. Now the bottom of the armhole it will be creased around the plate. Here is the bottom of the armhole, or the plate area, and that will be creased. And that will have dashes going around. So the top of the armhole is marked with dots, and the bottom of the armhole is marked with dashes. Now there is one place at the plate where there is a dash and a dot. They are usually separated by a little space because the ridge and the plate don't normally fall at exactly the same spot. So that at the screw mark, there are two marks. One is a dot and one is a dash. That completes the marking of the muslin on the form. All of the important places that we need for truing the muslin, which is the next step, are now on the muslin. And the muslin needs to be unpinned from the form. I'm going to unpin the muslin from the form by removing all of the holding pins, the pins that are actually holding it to the form. What I'm not removing are the dart pins just yet. The next steps are done on the table. The reason I removed the, the pins that are holding it to the form and not the dart pins is because sometimes, in your enthusiasm, you sometimes forget to mark the darts. Um, if you take the pins out and you haven't marked the darts, you're going to have to put the muslin back on the form. So before I remove the dart pins, I always check to see that my dart marks are clear. If they are, then the pin can come out. The muslin must be perfectly flat in order to true the lines. You never true lines on a muslin that are pinned unless you absolutely have to. And there are areas where you absolutely have to. But for the beginning marks, the muslin can be flat. I'm checking that my dot is clear and the line next to the dot is clear before I remove the pin holding the shoulder dart in place. OK. We will begin to true the muslin with the darts. Every dart has a wide place and a narrow place. The narrow place is where the body tends to fill up the fullness and you no longer need the dart. Therefore, every dart has a place where it begins and a place where it vanishes. The vanishing point always has to be determined. It can be determined on the form or in the case of a very basic muslin such as this one, it can be determined by measuring on the flat an amount down from the highest point. 
In, in this case, I'm measuring down from the apex, which is the largest place, one half inch and placing a cross mark. I'm then going to bring the smallest place, which was, was the waistline, bring the line from the waistline up to nothing at the vanishing point. One of the important points in truing any line, a dart, or any other line is that the line will never stop at the intersection, in this case, the waistline. It will always go through. So there will always be a cross mark of intersection. Join the one side, join the other side, being very careful that you're following your lines exactly and vanishing absolutely to nothing. It's very important that the dart vanish completely. Otherwise, when it's sewed, a bubble will appear at the end. That is the truing of the waistline dart. To true the shoulder dart, we're going to connect the dot, which was the first mark we made, the princess line mark, also the mark that's closest to the neckline, to the apex intersection, which is cross grain line apex intersection, and draw a line. Again, comes right through the dot, doesn't stop at the dot, continues on through. I'm going to measure on that line one half inch up and cross mark, and join the other place, which was the other side of the dart, the line we made, to that vanishing point. The shoulder dart is complete. While I am working with the ruler and while the muslin is nice and flat, I can, as I said before, join the other straight line, which is the underarm cross mark to the waistline cross mark. Side seam, underarm cross mark, waistline, side seam cross mark, join them. This line is a representation of this line on the form. It is the exact line that appears on the dress form. It appears here. It is called the tight body line. It is the line that is closest to the body and, if used, causes this garment to fit very close to the body. However, normally, clothes are not worn very close to the body, particularly if they are going to have a sleeve, which this muslin is going to have. It's going to have a sleeve set into it, and it therefore needs some moving room. In order to have enough room for a sleeve to go in and for whoever wears it to be able to move around in it, we're going to need to drop the armhole. Uh, it is not comfortable to wear a garment that comes up right up into the armpit. It's also not comfortable to try and move in a garment that is fitting skin tight if it is made out of woven fabric. Therefore, I'm going to be planning on dropping the armhole one inch in order to give it a little more room down for moving. And I'm also going to be adding a half inch of extra fabric at the lowered area in order to form some over-ease. Over-ease is amount of fabric that is used for moving room. The amount of over-ease can vary. However, on a basic bodice such as this one, we will measure down one inch from the plate mark, measuring right along the tight body line and cross mark. That is the lowering of the armhole. For the extending of the armhole, or the adding of the extra fabric for ease, I'm going to square from that side seam tight body line out for one half inch and place a dot. That dot will then become a cross mark. 
And since I only really need the ease at the underarm, and I really don't need it at the waistline, I'm going to join that lowered extended mark back to the waistline, thus forming a new side seam. And the new side seam is called the extended line. So we have two seams or two lines at the side, the tight body line and the extended line. The extended line is formed by coming down one inch from the plate side seam intersection and out a half inch. Having now determined that I am having this extension and having drawn it in, I'm then going to complete the armhole. The front armhole on a basic bodice can be drawn with a French curve and can be drawn all in one line if the curve is properly placed. There are three places for the placement of the curve. The lowered extended cross mark. The curve will go in between the dot and the dash and will come up to the shoulder ridge intersection. Now, you're going to take the curve and wiggle it around until you find that you're hitting all three places. Okay? We're looking for lowered extended cross mark between the dot and the dash up to the shoulder ridge. Now, in placing the curve so, you may or may not hit all the ridge marks, but you should be hitting all of your important three places. Now, one, two, three, draw the armhole all in one curve. Armhole. I'm going to trim away some of the extra fabric around the armhole, but trimming it in such a way that I'm leaving enough fabric so that I'm not cutting away the tight body plate cross mark, which means I'm going to leave approximately an inch and a half of fullness around the armhole. Okay, armhole is done. It's desirable to do as much as you can on the muslin while the muslin is flat. Therefore, I'm going to do the neckline next. The neckline is determined with the little dots that we made on the form. However, when you join a curved line, it can happen that the center front or the center of that line can form a point. In order to avoid that point when it's cut on the fold, I'm going to square that line for one quarter of an inch on grain. And then take the curve, being sure that the slashes are nicely closed, and place the curve so that I'm hitting all the dots coming up to the shoulder neckline intersection and follow the shape of the curve around. Now, this neckline represents the neckline on the form which is an unrealistic neckline because it's too tight to be worn. In order to make a garment that's wearable, this neckline will always have to be dropped for something. And of course, the style of the garment very often will determine how much. For a basic muslin, we're going to drop it one quarter of an inch. So from the center front, measure down one quarter of an inch from the center front cross mark, Square once more for a quarter of an inch from center. Now, what I'm trying to do is lower the neckline at the front without essentially changing the shape of the curve. Therefore, I'm going to place the curve back on the original neckline. I don't want to lower anything at the shoulder or make the shoulder any larger, shoulder neckline. Just want to do it at the front. So using the same configuration, I'm just going to drop the curve down and draw in a new neckline. This then becomes 
the neckline that we will use. The natural neckline appears, the lowered neckline appears. It's a good idea at this time then to measure the seam allowance and complete the neckline. The seam allowance will be measured from the lowered neckline. It is one half inch measured evenly all around using your ruler. Generally a curved seam will have one half inch of seam allowance. A straight seam generally will have one inch on a basic muslin. That then completes the neckline. What's left now to complete is the shoulder seam and the waistline. The shoulder seam will be completed next. In order to complete the shoulder seam, the dart must be closed. Every time you need to complete a line through which a dart makes its presence known, the dart should be closed, must be closed, before the shoulder seam or any other seam is trued over it. In order to close the dart, I'm going to have to crease one side of the dart and bring it over to the other. In the case of the shoulder dart, the fullness of the dart will face towards the center of the garment. And therefore, I'm going to crease the line closest to the center front first. Now, this line is bias, and bias does stretch. So you want to be very careful that as you crease it, you do not stretch it. Now, the dart will fit and close nicely if you cup the muslin so that the dart wants to come around. If you try to pin the dart with the muslin perfectly flat, you will not be successful. You must cup the muslin and bring the two edges of the dart together. You've gone to a lot of trouble to draw a very beautiful dart. What you don't want to do is now ignore the lines. Put them together absolutely perfectly. What we're trying to simulate is the sewing of the dart. When you sew a dart, the two edges come exactly together, and that's what we're going to pin. It's not necessary to pin right to the vanishing point. You can start a little way up. The dart will tend to stay together. What I am pinning is the edge, the folded edge, down to the other side of the dart, picking up just the smallest amount of fabric on the edge. In truth, when you sew a dart, you do not sew in the middle. You sew the two edges together. And since the pinning simulates sewing, that's what you would like to do. Pin just the edges together, edge to edge, matching the dart lines. All the way up, skipping the exact point of shoulder intersection so that I can place my ruler and join the neckline cross mark and the shoulder ridge cross mark in a straight line. Shoulder seam. To that, at the same time, I'm going to add a one inch seam allowance and trim. That will complete the shoulder seam. I'm trimming right through the fullness of the dart. And the shoulder then is complete. You can see that by pinning the shoulder dart, I've already started to form the body shape in the muslin. It is starting to become the three-dimensional garment that is necessary to go on a three-dimensional body. Okay? The last step in this is the pinning of the waistline dart. And that will be accomplished exactly the way I accomplished the shoulder dart. I'm going to cup the muslin, crease the side closest to the center. Now crease gently. Again, you're working with a bias. You don't want to stretch. And I'm going to bring the two sides of the dart together. If you cup the muslin, 
it will tend to come around nicely and give you the shape you want for your garment. The lines meet exactly. I'm picking up the barest edge of the fold, very minimal pickup, and down to the waistline cross mark. And then what appears to be necessary, and there's the body right there in the muslin, and what then appears to be necessary is the truing of the waistline. However, because the front waistline and the back waistline eventually will be one seam, that is, when you join a bodice and a skirt together, you would normally sew up the side seams of the front and the back and then treat the waistline as one seam. We are going to treat it as one seam as well. When the time comes to complete the back waistline, we will complete the front waistline and treat it as one seam. So at this point, the muslin is ready to go back on the form. First, because you want to see what you made. And second, because in order to drape the back muslin, the front muslin must be on the form, we'll pin it on, hopefully, exactly the way you draped it. You're pinning the natural neckline, and that's very important, pinning the natural neckline to the natural neckline. We'll pin the shoulder neckline intersection to the shoulder seam neckline intersection and the ridge to the ridge. Smooth the muslin down to a little above the apex. Raise the form and secure the waistline. Smooth the muslin up to below the apex. Remember, we're looking for just below the curve of the breast. And bring the muslin around to the side seam. The side seam is pinned, the side seam waistline intersection. An important point to remember here is that the waistline dart is never pinned below the waistline cross mark. The body gets sharply bigger below the waistline cross mark. And if you pin below it, you'll find the muslin will not fit back on the form. I'm putting back in the pinch of ease, smoothing the muslin back to the underarm plate intersection. We will pin the muslin back to the form exactly where we draped it at the underarm seam and the armhole intersection. We'll then return to the shoulder area because it's important that the shoulder seam be anchored in place with the shoulder seam line falling directly on the line of the form and with the pins sunk under the cover of the dress form and perfectly flat. When we begin to drape the back, we will be draping the back shoulder over the front shoulder using the front shoulder muslin line as the draping line. Therefore, these, mus these pins must be very flat so that we can drape over. So I'm going to sink the pins under the cover of the form, holding the shoulder in place, but not having any pins sticking up to cause the muslin not to drape flat. And that's the complete draping of the front bodice.